What's good, y'all? It's Boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're gonna check out 10 storylines. Fans begged WWE to end instantly. We've seen it, we've had to go through it. It's just a storyline that's just doesn't make sense it's awful it's cringe it's bad it's just like end it please end it please end this feud please end the storyline can we do something else we've seen it we've had to sit through it it's some of the worst part of wrestling at times awful storylines that get dragged out and keep going on longer than they should so we're gonna check this out Unfortunately, we're going to have to relive some of these horrible memories. Appreciate all the love and support y'all showing on the channel. Let's get right into it, man. One of the keys to executing a great storyline in WWE is the payoff. A yes. compelling storyline should have a strong end that leaves the fans satisfied. Unfortunately, WWE has a habit of not knowing when to call it a day, and a storyline can start off strongly, but the storyline can go on and on with yeah. no end in sight. So with that being said, let's look at 10 WWE storylines that overstayed their welcome. Number 10, Alberto Del Rio tries to fulfill his destiny. Uh, when Alberto Del Rio I remember arrived that. in WWE in 2010, <laughs> he was about my destiny. catapulted into the main event scene. WWE believed Del Rio could be a man. Instead of finishing the story, before we had that, the story, you know, Cody wanted to finish the story. It was all about Alberto Del Rio finishing his destiny. Jesus. <laughs> Major star, and to WWE's credit, Del Rio was able to get somewhat over with the audience. The problem began when Del Rio's gimmick of trying to fulfill his destiny and become world champion was put on hold time and time again. Del Rio uh -huh. won the 2011 Royal Rumble, and it looked like he was going to overcome world champion Edge at WrestleMania 27, but this didn't happen. Del Rio then lost other world title opportunities until he eventually cashed in on uh -huh. CM Punk at the 2011 SummerSlam event. Del Rio's multiple reigns in late 2011 were all disappointing, but WWE were persistent on making Del Rio a huge deal. So the storyline of Del Rio on the hunt for world title gold continued into 2012. 2012 saw Del Rio feud with Sheamus, and to say that this storyline and feud overstayed its welcome would be an yeah. understatement. The feud went on forever, and the pay-per-view matches felt like mid-card matches and did little to present the world title in the best light. Ultimately, Del Rio's storyline was a waste of time, and WWE could have put more effort into other storylines within the company. Yeah. Number 9, The Guest Host Era of Raw oh. While it's not a storyline as such, the guest host era of Raw was a period which fans don't look back on fondly. No. The idea was that a different celebrity would host Raw each week, and the logic from WWE's perspective was that this would bring in new fans, but this simply didn't happen. No. A strong majority of the guest hosts chosen for Raw weren't fans of WWE, Summer so they Fest. had zero idea what was happening, yes. and it was made clear that they were only here for a cheap payday. There were a few exceptions to this, however, as iconic names such as Bob Barker and Hugh Jackman mm -hmm. genuinely added something positive to the show. Yeah. Unfortunately, the concept lasted way too long, and it highlighted that WWE were failing to understand what their audience wanted to see on Raw each and every week. Number 8, Michael Cole's Heel Run. One of the most fr Oh my god. Uh, oof. It, it wasn't good heel He It was... I'm about to change the channel because he is insufferable. I don't want to hear what he has to say. It's not good heel heat. It's he's the voice that we're listening to cover this damn match. And I don't want to hear it no more. It was bad. It was bad. I don't care what nobody says. Some people enjoyed it. I did. not A lot of people didn't because it was like, bro, this is not. No, get stop this. Awful. Frustrating angles of the PG era has been Michael Cole's heel run. In 2010, Cole turned heel, and in a weird move, Cole started to call Raw each and every week as a full-blown villain. It was a change of pace, as traditionally the play-by-play -play guy on WWE TV would call the action right down the middle. middle yes. Cole was obnoxious, distracting, and it was hard to enjoy Raw each week with Cole yes. at the helm. According to Cole himself during an appearance on After the Bell, it was Vince McMahon's direct call to make him go on an extended run as a heel. Of course! Vince McMahon decided Michael Cole in real life is a sarcastic prick anyway. Why not capitalize on this backlash and make him a bad guy? Vince McMahon used to hold a class at TV about 10 years ago called Promo Class. One day he threw me up there with our truth Truth and I stole the show. 
At that point in time, Vince was like, this guy's a prick, he's a heel. It led to about a two year run where there was no in between. People either really loved the character or thought it was this travesty against everything that was ever done. <laughs> play by play guy cannot be a bad guy. He has to be this voice of reason. It's the worst decision that WWE has ever made. Also during this time, Cole embarked in a feud with fellow commentator yeah. Harry the King Lawler. This also lasted way too long, and the two were even awarded with a lengthy WrestleMania match. Ugh. The storyline of Cole as a heel was an interesting experiment that ultimately failed in a huge way, and hopefully WWE never does anything similar again. No. Number seven, no the more. anonymous Raw general manager. Speaking of Michael, I hated that shit too. I have a email from the. Oh, but it was so. <laughs> this shit was dark days, y'all. Dark days. Cole. Cole was a key part in yet another storyline that went on for far too long. In the summer of 2010, Raw's new authority figure would be presented as a mystery figure who controlled the show by sending emails to a laptop. When an email was received, Cole would stand on a podium and read the announcement to the disdain of the crowd. Fans at first had high hopes in terms of who, who would it be was, the yeah. mystery authority figure, with names being thrown around including Triple H and Eric Bischoff. It was later revealed that WWE had no concrete plans in place, as two years later, the anonymous Raw GM was revealed to be Hornswoggle in one of the laziest reveals in company history. We've overcome a lot, y'all. We've overcome so much. Be thankful the WWE we have now. History. Number six, Sasha Banks tries to vanquish Charlotte Flair. Sasha Banks and Charlotte Flair engaged in an all-out war over the Raw Women's title in 2016. Yeah. The matches between the two decorated female stars were excellent, but the storyline became frustrating as the weeks went on. WWE told the storyline in a complex manner, and it saw Banks overcome Flair on WWE TV, mm -hmm. then Flair would win the title back right. at the next pay-per-view. Which was stupid. This lasted for four months, and WWE fans were baffled as to what the purpose of the story was supposed to be. Yeah. The storyline made Banks look completely incompetent as a babyface, and the hot potato between the two with the title didn't exactly add a ton of value to the women's title itself. Nope. Number five, Roman Reigns tries to silence Baron Corbin. In late 2019, Roman Reigns entered into Ugh. a feud with Baron Corbin. This feud would receive widespread criticism. This was one of the worst feuds Roman Reigns had ever been in, and I was so glad that he said, I'm done with this shit, and when he came back, we got something great. Criticism from fans, and it even led to Reigns having enough of WWE creative. Yes. The feud between the two lasted for months on end, and the feud was completely lifeless. Elements of the feud were so insultingly bad, and it was clear that certain segments were designed to make Vince McMahon laugh. Paul Heyman would discuss how much the infamous feud weighed on Reigns during an appearance yeah. of Rick Rubin's Tetragrammation podcast, and this is what he had to say. The feud rivalry with Baron Corbin over dog food and the infamous Suffer and Succotash promo had weighed on him enough to where he said, I've had enough, I've reached the cap, I can't go any further. Mm -hmm. As the big dog, I've peaked, and as an athlete, I haven't peaked as a performer. I've barely scratched the surface, I have so much more to offer, and since I'm taking time off, I'm not coming back as the same person. Number four. And it worked. We have the best version of him. Oh, man. Or Kane and Lita's romance. Ugh. Kane has notoriously been involved in several outlandish and insane storylines throughout his career, but perhaps the most notable was the time he began a storyline with Lita during the Ruthless Aggression <laughs> era. The storyline would last for a considerable amount of time, and it would have twist after twist, and with each twist, the storyline seemed to get even weirder. It was super the storyline weird. took shape following WrestleMania 20, as Kane would fall in love with Lita, and when Lita shockingly announced that she was pregnant, it was revealed that Kane was the father. Kane would then enter into a feud with Lita's real-life boyfriend, Matt Hardy, and in a truly unique stipulation, Kane and Hardy <laughs> faced off in a till-death-do-us-part match at SummerSlam, with Lita marrying the victor. Kane would win the match, but then in a truly baffling twist, WWE decided to experiment with Kane as a babyface. That's right, the man who had impregnated and kidnapped Lita was going to turn into a good guy. <laughs> During a match with Gene Snitsky, Kane accidentally fell on Lita, and this resulted in Lita losing her baby. Snitsky would then become a crazed heel, whilst Kane set out to avenge his deceased baby. 
When Lita eventually returned to WWE TV, <laughs> it was portrayed as if she was now on good terms with Kane. That was until Lita turned on him in favor of Edge, making Lita the new villain of this story. <laughs> this was just all bad. <laughs> just all bad, bro. We are. Number three, Shane McMahon's Reign of Tyranny. Ooh. In 2018, WWE began to plant the seeds for Shane McMahon to become a central part of WWE programming. This was bad, McMahon too. would win the World Cup at the 2018 Crown Jewel event, which was already a controversial move, as McMahon made easy work of former world champion Dolph Ziggler. McMahon would be christened as the best in the world, and this would be his gimmick moving forward. McMahon would join forces with The Miz, and the two had an enjoyable run at first before it went completely off the rails when McMahon turned heel. Fans expected this to build towards McMahon putting over a babyface Miz at WrestleMania 35, but in shocking fashion, McMahon won the match. In fact, McMahon won every subsequent match against The Miz, which completely annihilated Miz's <laughs> babyface run. Following I forgot all about that. The, the Miz couldn't beat Shane McMahon. It was so just dumb booking, bro. That makes no fucking sense. The lackluster feud with Miz coming to an end, McMahon would enter into a feud with Roman Reigns. Yeah. And this dominated SmackDown. McMahon would cut long-winded promos and have a ton of TV time dedicated to him. McMahon would even defeat Reigns on pay-per-view, which was a truly baffling decision, as Reigns was one of the most protected talents in the entire company. The McMahon experiment was a complete waste of time, as it failed to get anyone over, and ultimately yeah. led to fans reaching for the remote. Yeah. Number two, twice in a lifetime. <laughs> Following WrestleMania 27, WWE took a huge creative risk. WWE announced The Rock vs. John Cena for WrestleMania 28 with one year of notice. This was done to lock down The Rock for a match and create as much hype as possible. WWE did a decent job in building the matchup, mm -hmm. and the WrestleMania 28 buy rate of 1.3 million Ooh. buys was evidence that WWE had done the right thing. Unfortunately, in 2013, WWE made the decision to book The Rock vs. Cena once again for WrestleMania uh -huh. 29. WWE had promoted their first encounter as a once-in-a-lifetime matchup, so this was a huge spit in the face to everyone who had invested their time and money in the feud. Mm -hmm. The build-in storyline to the WrestleMania 29 encounter was focused on the WWE title, but WWE were treading the same ground and repeating the same story beats of the prior year, so interest was at an all-time low. Fans were frustrated and bored, and this likely explains why WrestleMania 29 saw a decrease of almost 300,000 pay-per-view buys. Because they already saw it. They, you knew... You knew who was going to win. It wasn't... John Cena wasn't going to lose twice. They could have freshened it up if they would have had John Cena go heel going into the match. That's what they should have did. It probably would have been more interesting. Have him go heel. But they didn't, so... Number one, Triple H's reign of terror. Oh. Due to names such as The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin taking a step back from in-ring action, WWE were forced to put Triple H as the face of Monday Night Raw back in 2002. Eesh. Whilst the game was incredible in the ring, yeah. the so-called reign of terror between 2002 and 2005 wasn't exactly the most celebrated part of his career. It wasn't. For years, the game dominated Raw, and he seemed to defeat every babyface who came into his path. Rob Van Dam, Kane, Randy Orton, and Booker T all could have defeated the game and vanquished yep. the top heel on Raw, but WWE persisted with having a heel dominate Raw. A lot of fans switched off the product during this time period as Triple H became completely insufferable. Mm -hmm. From WWE's perspective, there is perhaps an argument to be made that Triple H was the biggest star on the show, so it made business sense to revolve the top story arc around him. But that argument won't be popular amongst fans of that respective era. Of course. The three-year-long story arc would thankfully come to a close at WrestleMania 21. The game would put Batista over yeah. in the main event of WrestleMania. And this started a path of Triple H going in a slightly different direction in WWE. The Batista thing worked out, but I do agree. There was a few points they could have at least did something you know, obviously they gave Goldberg the rub, but it was only for like one month and then that was it. So <laughs> it didn't really amount to anything. He got the title right back. So it's just one of those things where they could have, uh, for me, the Booker T situation still is one of those things where they could have did something there great. He didn't even have to have a long, lengthy title reign, but you could have did something and they decided to say, no, 
we're gonna have this guy lose. Even even with the the racial tones in the segment, we're still gonna have this guy lose. Made no sense. But hey, it is what it is, man. Comment down below. Let me know some other storylines in WWE that you guys remember where you was like, make it stop, please. Or it was uh, change the channel worthy. But I appreciate all the love support y'all showing on the channel. Road to 150K. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See you on the next one. Peace.